Hello and welcome to the Trade Business Accountants Recession Proof Masterclass, where today I'll be teaching you the seven step fortress formula that any trade business, no matter the industry, market, or size, can use to survive, thrive, and recession proof their business and income in 28 days or less. Now, I've built this training because I know there's a lot of trade business owners out there right now that are starting to feel concerned about what the economy is going to look like over the next 12 to 24 months, what that outlook is going to look like. Because as much as we'd like the good times to last forever, the reality is they don't. It's just the nature of the economy. It's the nature of these cycles. You know, we saw this over a decade ago following the GFC where there were a lot of trade business owners who took massive hits to their companies. For some, it would have felt like their revenues were cut in half. A lot of them were, were forced to actually let key staff members go. And you know, even worse, we saw thousands upon thousands of trade business owners going into debt and many of those having to, to later file for personal bankruptcy, which was just an absolutely devastating blow to the industry and people's livelihoods. And you know, with all that being said, though, that's why you know, I've put this training together. That's why I believe now is the time to get in early to pull your head out of the sand and start planning for the future so that you actually stay ahead of the curve and best prepare for what's destined to come. You know, I know there's there's still plenty of work coming through the door right now. Um, your books are probably still looking relatively strong, but the reality is, the hard reality is, we know a downturn is coming. Like I said, it's just the nature of these things. And, and when the downturn comes, you don't want to be caught with your pants down. Now, with all that being said, I don't want to make this masterclass all about you know, the doom and gloom side of the recession, because I know there's a lot of talk out there, a lot of negativity with everything going on. But if you're prepared and you've got everything sorted, everything in place, this could actually be one of the greatest opportunities that you'll ever see in your business. Because, you know, history has shown us that those who have dramatically amplified their success or wealth have typically done so on the back of hard times. You just got to be prepared. That's the key, because when the fog clears, you know, when the skies open up, it's the trade business owners who were prepared who will have an ocean of opportunity come their way. You just need to make sure you're in a position to capitalize on it because most trade business owners won't be. You know, when the floodgates reopen, the reality is that's when we're going to see a lot of trade business owners struggle and a lot of trade businesses going under. And that might sound counterintuitive because you'd think most would struggle in the downturn. And when the floodgates reopen, that that's almost going to be the savior. But the reality is at the beginning of a downturn for most businesses, their cash flow is actually pretty good. And that's because the money owed from past jobs continues to flow in and less money is actually going out to deliver those future jobs because less work is being performed. You know, less work is sitting in, in the books. Whereas in a market recovery, the opposite happens. It switches. There's, there's a turn of the tables here. And it's because now there isn't enough cash coming in from past jobs delivered during the downturn to actually fund the increase in workload coming from the upswing and the upcycle. Business needs more cash to grow and tackle new opportunities than what it's bringing in. There's a bit of a lag effect taking place with cash. And, you know, we saw a perfect example of this was Sydney and Melbourne during the COVID pandemic in, in 2020 and 2021. Most trade businesses were actually able to survive the shutdowns themselves. But the problem was when everything reopened because at that point, you know, they'd spent the last two, three, four months having the cash coming in from, from jobs before the lockdowns, funding their bills, funding their wages and stuff like that. There was also, you know, the, the assistance from the government. But when everything reopened and, and opportunity started coming back through the door, they didn't have the cash there to actually fund those opportunities. And it wasn't just immediately, it was, it was the following two to three months because there was a lag effect because even once they started those jobs in that first month and, and second month, it took a while for that cash to actually start coming back in to be able to actually fund the future jobs. And it was a really, really bad position for a lot of trade business owners. In fact, it was quite tragic to see. But if anything, what I want you to do is use that as a recent lesson of what to expect in this downturn, because we're going to see a similar relationship with cash flow. And that's why this training isn't actually just about surviving a recession. It's about being in a position to thrive on the other side when the floodgates of opportunity open, because as much as it pains me to say this, most trade businesses just won't be able to. They'll be in a tight cash position or maybe even in serious debt, and they won't be able to capitalize on the recovery. That's why boosting cash flow now is actually more critical than ever. You want to be in a position to capitalize on the bounce back. And that means, you know, you've got to play the game smart here, guys. You've got to prioritize cash flow because cash flow is king in your business. You know, we talk about this a lot, but at the end of the day, cash is the lifeblood. Cash is the oxygen of your business. You can get away with okay people. 
uh, you can get away with okay strategy or even okay execution. But if you run out of cash because of poor cash flow, it's game over. That's why both protecting and boosting cash flow has actually never been more important than it is today. Costs are rising, uh, inflation is rising, there's, there's greater volatility, uh, more red tape, there's more uncertainty, uh, and there's even a potential recession in the cards. So strong cash flow is actually going to be the key to surviving those tough times ahead and more importantly, thriving in the recovery on the other side. So my challenge for you today as a trade business owner is to ignore all the distractions around you and stay focused on only what you can control. This is how you're going to prepare for what may be the greatest opportunity that you'll ever see in your business because the decisions you make now will determine the outcome of your business over the next six to 12 to 18 months from now. And that's what this training is all about, helping you to know exactly what you need to focus on to prepare in the fastest way possible to not only survive, but also thrive in this incoming downturn. Now, to be completely transparent with you, my intentions with giving away this training for free is first and foremost to help you out and help you make a lot of money, which is something that, that I'm personally very passionate about, but also so that you can experience what we're all about here at TBA and how we're completely different to your typical account. And then hopefully you'll use our specialist coaching and accounting services moving forward. So whether you're just starting out or just cracked your first million and are now in the seven figure zone, or even if you're sitting at eight figures and looking to take your business to the next level. In today's session, I'm going to arm you with the exact step-by-step -step formula that you need to fortify your business and income in 28 days or less. Now, before I go any further, let's just quickly cover off on who we are and you know why we're qualified to teach you on this topic. Well, our company is Trade Business Accountants, a specialist accounting firm that works exclusively with Australian trade and construction businesses. Our primary goal is to help our clients build greater security in their business by dramatically increasing their profits and cash. We have over 30 years of hands-on experience across the trade, construction and finance industries. Uh, and over these years, our team has advised trade businesses anywhere from startup to $30 million in revenue, and even some of Australia's largest developers and tier one builders. Now, outside of the trade industry, our team have also advised and run as CFOs and CEOs of large global companies valued up to $10 billion. Now, me personally, I'm a client advisor here at Trade Business Accountants, and I help to simplify financial management for trade and construction business owners to help them generate millions of dollars worth of profit and cash every single year. And I've distilled a lot of that knowledge into this training today. So with that being said, let's dive in. All right, so the first step of the Fortress formula is to control the pace of your cash flow. And what I mean by that is making sure that you have a tight handle on how fast cash comes in and out of your business. Because if we can increase the speed that cash comes in and slow down how fast it actually goes out, then you'll end up having more cash sitting in your business bank account at any one time. And obviously, the more cash you have sitting in your account versus someone else's, the better. Look at it this way. Here we have a typical trade business cash in and out timeline uh, where there's a total of 71 days between the time stock is purchased to when a customer actually pays for that item of stock in the invoice and cash comes in the door, which is a massive period of time to have cash not coming in. And to make matters worse, within those 71 days, we have a whole bunch of wage and overhead payments that need to get paid as well, which is even more cash going out before you get paid. This is why we want to get cash in the door ASAP and slow down cash going out. Because if, for example, we cut this timeline down from 71 days to 11 days, you're going to get cash in the door way faster. And there's a lot less cash going out the door before you get paid, keeping more cash in your bank account. Don't be the contractor who just watches their bank balance go up and down without any clarity on what's going on. Be in control of your own cash flow. Don't let it control you. Now, some strategies to get the cash in the door faster. Uh, you know, you can invoice your customers as soon as possible. You know, if you're taking weeks or even months to issue invoices, then, you know, it's going to take weeks or even months for you to get paid. The clock doesn't start ticking until the invoice is in their hands. So the faster you invoice, the faster you get paid. Uh, you can also reduce your works in progress. So this is more so something for, for project-based contractors. But what you need to be doing here is essentially invoicing earlier and more frequently. So this way you're getting cash in the door faster uh, and more regularly rather than just delivering large components of work before you even see a dollar, which is gonna eat up big sums of your cash reserves and put you at greater risk of running out of cash. Another thing you can do is intimately understand client payment cycles and dates. You know, For example, if all your work is with builders and you're on 60 to 90 day terms, get crystal clear on how their payment system operates so that you aren't caught out in not understanding their payment cycles and dates. Because 
If you're on a 30 day contract and you miss the deadline to submit your claims and you're forced to wait another 30 days, well, that's going to hurt a lot. So again, get in tune with their cycles and their dates. Another strategy is to actually build a great relationship with not only the builder, but also the accounts person or basically anyone that's holding the keys to the kingdom and determining who gets paid, how much they get paid and when they get paid, because the better your relationship with that person, the more likely you are to get paid sooner rather than later. And a little side note there too is to make sure you send the invoice to the person who's actually paying the bills. Just because you agreed on a project sale and payment terms with an individual doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to be the ones responsible for paying the invoice. It pays to know the person who's paying the bills. Next, you need to have a system in place to follow up and chase your money. Don't just assume that because you've sent an invoice, everyone will automatically follow your payment terms. Successful business owners know they're in the collections business, whether they like it or not. It's best to let people know that prompt and proper payment is actually important to you. They'll respect that because it's the sign of a good businessman. If they don't, well, is that really someone that you want to be working for at the end of the day? On the same note, another point here is to collect debt weekly. It doesn't matter how much profit you have on paper, it's cash that pays the bills. Set aside the time or make someone on your team responsible for collecting debt weekly and reducing that list of age receivables that you have in your business. Another strategy is to use your accounting software to actually generate a report of what's outstanding and who owes it. Then go through that list in order from most overdue and start that follow-up process. Call and email. Call and email. This is the time to start collecting what is owed you? Because get this, on average, 5 to 15% of revenue goes uncollected every single year. That's a lot of work being delivered for free. For example, let's say you do a million dollars in sales and just 5% of that goes uncollected. Well, 5% of a million dollars is $50,000. Now, you might be thinking, well, $50,000 compared to a million dollars doesn't seem like a whole lot of money. But you have to understand how this impacts the bottom line. So let's break it down. Say you have a pre-tax profit margin of 10%. That means $100,000 of that million dollars should be profit. But because of the lost $50,000 worth of sales, your profit is actually only $50,000 now. And suddenly that uncollected $50,000 seems like a lot of money, especially considering that this 5% of uncollected sales is actually equivalent to 50% of your overall net profit. And to make things worse, to make up for that lost $50,000 profit, you're going to need an additional million dollars worth of sales just to get your profit back to where it should have been if you actually collected all the money that was owed to you by your clients. That's just insane. You'd literally have to double your sales doing an extra million dollars worth of work just to get your profit back. That's why you need to be collecting money much, much faster in your business because a sale only ends once money exchanges hands. I was actually talking to an electrical contractor the other day and he was telling me a story about when his business was actually growing quite rapidly around 2014, 2015, 2016. And during that period, he, he said he got a bit carried away with all that growth that he wasn't actually staying on top of his invoices and tracking his receivable days. And it turned out he was so busy winning work and delivering those projects that he ended up with over $700,000 that he hadn't collected over the past two years that he'd completely forgotten about. He'd literally forgotten about $700,000 worth of money owed to him. So don't let that be you. It doesn't matter how many sales you do or what annual turnover you're pulling if cash isn't hitting your bank account. Really, really important. All right, so some more points on getting the cash in the door faster. Uh, you can communicate payment terms up front. You know, payment shouldn't be a backroom discussion. Hourly rate, quoted, inclusions, exclusions, whatever it is, you need to educate your customers on how you do business and what you expect from them up front. Don't keep it a secret. Your payment terms aren't going to be important to anyone else unless you make them important. Another really, really important point is to get approval and a written signature before starting any works. And this goes for variation too. If it's not signed off, you're working for free. Don't build someone else's project at your expense. You're not their bank. Make sure you're getting stuff signed off and agreed upon before you do anything. Another strategy is, uh, if possible, see if you can get payment on completion. This should be a non-negotiable if you're in the residential service and maintenance game. But if you're in other markets, see if you can get away with it. And on that same note, see if you can get a deposit as well, even if it's just for materials. Deposits at the end of the day are a huge BS detector. You know, I know it can be difficult to do it in the commercial space, but you know, right now it's, it's an interesting environment and you'd be surprised with what you can get away with in your negotiations right now. So again, that's another one to consider. Uh, another point is to make invoices clear 
detailed and professional. You know, the client needs to know what they're paying for. So list the details of the job in a way that makes sense to them. Any confusion or mistake is only going to delay payment because they're not understanding what they're actually paying for. And then as a final point, whenever possible, stop working with clients who are unlikely to pay their bills. Banks do this as a matter of procedure as basic risk management. You should do the same. You should hold the same standards. We don't want to be working with people who don't pay. Some other ways to get the cash in the door faster, this is more so from a stock perspective, is to actually limit the amount of stock you hold. Yes, you're planning to, to sell this stock to a customer, but that might not happen for days, weeks, months, or even years. So rather than you actually building up your stock going into a downturn, start focusing now on trying to sell that stock, reduce the stock you're holding and build your cash reserves instead because that's going to be much more important because stock at the end of the day isn't going to pay your bills and it isn't going to pay the wages cash does. Now, some ways to help limit your stock include reducing the variations in material brands and product types. So you're more frequently using your stock rather than just having it, you know, uh, some stock that's sitting there that's getting rarely used and collecting dust on the shelves. Uh, you can try for more accurate order sizes to limit your outgoings. Um, you can renegotiate supply lead times to limit the time it takes for you to turn your supply purchases into cash on a job. Uh, and lastly, you can use a job management system to better manage stock and inventory so you know what you hold rather than forgetting what you purchased and never using it. Those are just some key things that you can use to actually start getting cash in the door faster and having a better control of the pace. Now, on the flip side, we also want to be slowing down the cash going out. So some things you can do here are purchasing materials on credit terms uh, and likewise don't front your cash to, to fund projects. This way you're not digging into, into those cash reserves before the project starts, which is ultimately going to put your business at risk. Um, you can also look to maximize your payment terms with suppliers and subbies. Now, it's important here that, you know, we're not trying to stitch up our suppliers. You know, the last thing we want to do is damage your relationship with them. But the key here is timing. If payment is due on the 30th, pay on the 30th. You don't want to pay anything until you have to. Then once you've done that, make sure you start to focus on building a strong relationship with your supplier and subbies. This way you can actually earn their trust and negotiate more favorable terms to better protect your cash. Ideally, you want to marry up your payment terms with your suppliers and subbies. For example, if your subby payment terms are 15 days, but yours are 30 days, then you're going to run into cash flow problems because you're going to have to be paying out more frequently to your suppliers and subbies versus the, the frequency at which cash comes in the door for you. So either get your terms down to the 15 days or bring your subbies terms up to 30 days. The key here is to just keep them aligned. We actually had a client who was delivering large projects here in Queensland uh, and they were having some cash flow issues on their projects. So what we did is, you know, after a bit of digging, we realized that many of their subbies had actually had shorter payment cycles than, than what our client did, which was obviously an issue. So what we did, or one of the first things we did with them was actually get them to marry up their payment terms with their subbies. And it worked great because they had a great relationship with their subbies. And that's a key thing here is, you know, they were more than happy to push back their, their payment terms from, from, a, from a fortnightly basis to the 30 day payment terms that our client was on, on these projects. And that made sure everyone was aligned uh, and that ensured that, you know, everyone's cash flow was healthy on these projects. So Again, that's some key strategies that you can use to start getting cash in the door faster and slowing down the rate at which cash is actually going out. All right, so my challenge for you in this step is to grab your cash flow by the horns and start actioning some of the points that I've listed there. You know, just two or three minor changes in any one of these areas can have a substantial impact on the cash flow in your business. So if you need to, go back through the last five to 10 minutes and choose two to three of these strategies that you're gonna start tackling first Jot them down because we'll loop back to, to those at the end. All right, so that's step one of the Fortress formula, control the pace of your cash flow. Now, the next step in the Fortress formula is to protect your gross margin. Now, for those who don't know, your gross margin is simply the percentage of sales revenue that will be gross profit. For example, if you were to price a job at $10,000 and you estimate your labor and your material costs to be $6,000, that means you're planning to make $4,000 in gross profit or a 40% gross profit margin. Now, knowing this is, is actually pretty important because your gross profit is the engine room of your business. It's what one, covers your overhead costs and two, what gives you a return in pre-tax profit at the end of the day. So if you aren't making any gross profit or not enough of it, you're going to be in trouble here because you're either going to be eroding your pre-tax profit. For example, here we've got a 10% price reduction and you can see it eating away at the pre-tax profit or even worse, you could go as far as eroding your margin to a point where it's not even enough to cover your overhead costs, which means 
you know, you're you're beyond breaking even. You're actually losing money at this point. So this is why you need to actually protect your gross margin going into this downturn. Now, I'm going to be transparent here. Protecting your margins is going to be one of the hardest steps right now in this formula. And that's mainly for two reasons. One, keeping your margin at the same level in a downturn can actually be quite difficult because there's going to be fewer projects. And that means, you know, when there's fewer projects, competition intensifies, it gets more intense, uh, which is going to cause other trade businesses to start slashing their prices uh, in order to try and keep their volume up and to try and keep that work coming in, which is going to make it harder for everyone else to actually maintain their own gross margin as, as the standard of the industry drops. And then point two is obviously following COVID, we've been experiencing challenges with material supply causing more project delays. Uh, there's inflationary pressure with spikes in material prices, uh, increases in the cost of labor. You know, these are all things that are going to increase your your overall cost to deliver the work that you do, which is going to eat away at your gross margin, which isn't ideal. So obviously, you know, moving forward, your margins are going to be under a lot of pressure. But at the end of the day, we can't do anything about it. We can't change that. That that stuff is external. It's outside of our control. So, you know, us sitting here and crying about it, uh, that's going to help no one. And it certainly isn't going to help you uh, going into this recession and thriving the other side. That's why what you need to do right now is to start getting a strategy in place that's going to allow you to actually protect your gross margin. And the first part of that strategy is to make sure you don't cut your prices because here's what typically happens. You know, when the phone stops ringing, when the economy tanks, when things get tighter, things get harder, what happens? Most business owners say, I've got to be more competitive. I've got to lower my prices. The reality is it's actually the worst thing you can do because more work doesn't mean more money. When the economy sucks, you know, when the phone calls drop, it means you have less opportunity to make the profit that you need to keep the doors open. So you actually need to maximize every opportunity that comes your way. This means avoiding the temptation to cut your prices and actually charge what makes sense for your business. Prices that allow you to cover your costs, that allow you to continue delivering a great service and a great experience for your customers and ultimately to make a profit for yourself at the end of the day. Now, to really drive this point home, let's jump into the numbers. So here I've modeled out a business, you know, a typical trade business roughly turning $3 million per year. Um, on the left side here, I've got the, the 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 current situation before the downturn. And then on the right side, I've got two separate scenarios of, you know, a business owner who makes a call whether they cut their prices or not, they cut their prices uh, during the downturn. So first things first, you know, their business currently, it's got 2,000 opportunities uh, coming through the door. So that's 2,000 inquiries, 2,000 leads coming in. From that, they're converting 50% of those into jobs. So They've got a uh, thousand jobs that they're doing each year. Of those thousand jobs, their average job sales size is three thousand dollars. Their average job cost of goods sold or job costs—that's your labour, your materials, and so on—are totaling two thousand dollars. That means their average job gross profit is coming out at a thousand dollars. So at the end of the day, that's a thirty-three percent job gross profit margin. That's the thousand dollars divided by the three thousand dollar job sales size. From there, once we extrapolate that over the year, what we end up with is an annual revenue of three million annual cost of goods sold of 2 million, annual gross profit of 1 million. Uh, and then we've assumed an annual overhead here of $700,000, which is pretty reasonable. That's going to be roughly you know, a 23%, 24% uh, overhead rate as a percentage of revenue. Uh, and what that is going to leave after we minus that $700,000 from the million dollars is a $300,000 annual pre-tax profit which comes out as a 10% annual pre-tax profit margin. Now, on the other side, during the downturn, what we've got here is a cut in the opportunities there. So it's roughly a 40% reduction in opportunities. Like I'm saying, the market's going to shrink. There's less opportunity, less leads, less inquiries. Uh, so naturally, that's going to reduce the volume of work. Now, first scenario here, we've got cutting the price by 10%. So uh, what happens here is the conversion in this case actually goes up from 50% to 50% to 60%. They've cut their prices to 10%. They're more desirable to more people. And typically the people they're going to be more desirable to are going to be the more price-driven customers. With that 10% increase, it means that they're ending up with a total volume of 750 jobs throughout the year. Now, obviously it's not a thousand, but you know that's not a 40% reduction. So while there's been a 40% reduction in opportunity, there's only been a 25% reduction in volume of work. So they've saved that volume a bit more. Now here, because they've reduced their prices by 10%, the average job sales size is now 2,700. Uh, the average job cost is $2,000, still the same. Uh, but now the average job gross profit has shrunk by 300 bucks. It's that $700 now. That is now a 26% gross profit margin. Now, again, once we extrapolate that over the year, 
the annual revenue is now you know a bit over two million. Our annual COGS is 1.5 million. Our annual gross profit is 525k, which is again the revenue minus the cost of goods sold. Now here we've got an annual overhead reduction uh, from $700,000 to $600,000. So because we're doing 25% uh, you know less jobs in the year, we've had you know roughly a 15% thereabouts uh, reduction in overhead because at the end of the day, overhead is there for the sole purpose of supporting uh, the ability to deliver work and you know and build stuff. So there's going to be a natural reduction in overhead as you do less work. So at this, even though they've managed to, you know, have an increase in volume as a percentage of opportunity because they've had an increase in, in conversion, uh, they're actually losing money. So annual pre-tax profit comes out as negative $75,000, which is negative 3.7% uh, pre-tax profit margin, which isn't good at all. So that's a common scenario that we actually see a lot is people trying to maintain that volume. They, uh, they reduce their prices to keep that volume up, uh, but it ends up hurting them really, really bad and they start losing money. Now, the other alternative here is the contractor decides, no, I'm not going to cut my prices. I'm going to keep them the same. Let's have a look at what this looks like. So same opportunities, 1,250. Here, there's actually been a reduction in conversion. Just again, worst case scenario, we've dropped that from 50% to 40%. And that's just assuming because there are other contractors uh, cutting their prices, that's going to be more attractive to more clients, more builders, whoever you're working for. Um, so you're naturally going to see a reduction in your conversion, even though you're keeping your prices the same as that, that standard drops that I'm talking about. So that means 40% of 1,250 opportunities is 500 jobs throughout the year. Now here we've got the same uh, same job sales size, same cog, same gross profit as the as currently before the downturn. Now, once we extrapolate that over the year, we end up with revenue of 1.5 million. So a 50% reduction in, in, in revenue. Uh, we've got cogs of 1 million. We've got annual gross profit now of $500,000. So if you see there already, they're doing 250 less jobs throughout the year than the contractor who cut their prices by 10%, yet they're only making $25,000 less gross profit. So not a huge variance there. But here's the key differentiator. Because they are doing 250 less jobs than the contractor who cut their price by 10% and 500 less jobs than the than what they were doing before uh, the, the actual downturn, so a 50% reduction in volume, there's naturally going to be a reduction in overhead here. So we've reduced it to... $450,000. So there's not a full 50% reduction in overhead. That rarely happens, uh, but there is a lot of flexibility there because there's not as much overhead needed to support uh, that workflow or that 50% that reduction in workflow that we've seen. So at the end of the day, what we end up with here is $50,000 in pre-tax profit and a 3.3% uh, annual pre-tax profit margin. Now, it's not fantastic. But that's a lot better than losing money. So again, this is why from a numbers perspective, and you can model this out as many different ways as you want, but from a numbers perspective, uh, this relatively holds true in you know 99% of scenarios. Uh, it's largely best for, for most contractors is maintain your prices, accept the reduction in volume and look to look to downsize. In this case, we you know we're downsizing overhead. You know, you might have to remove employees and stuff like that, but I'll touch on that in a second. But again, it's always better here to, to keep prices the same than it is to cut it. That's the main rule here. Now, obviously, I don't know your specific circumstances, so make sure you go talk with your own accountant about this. But at the very least, the golden rule here is you need to prioritize profit, not volume. This is one of the biggest mistakes that we see trade business owners make when it comes to a downturn. They push hard to maintain volume at the sacrifice of margin. But the reality is a decline in revenue and volume should be expected in a downturn. There's less opportunity out there to actually maintain the same amount of work. You shouldn't be looking to maintain the same volume in a downturn as what you had in an expansion period of the economy. And this is because if you're trying to maintain volume in a declining market, it actually means you're trying to increase market share. This is because that overarching pool of projects and opportunity in the market is shrinking. So by trying to keep your volume at its current levels, you're actually looking to take over more of the market here. We've got an example where, you know, before the downturn, we got 100,000 jobs. And let's say, for example, your share is 10,000 of those jobs. Now in a downturn, there's there's not 50, there's not 100,000 jobs anymore. There's only $50,000, for example. So a 50% reduction in the market opportunity. Now, if the market shrinks by 50%, that means your business is also going to shrink by 50% or the opportunity that, that presents itself. So you've gone from 10,000 jobs to now 5,000 jobs. Now, if you're trying to maintain your volume at that 10,000 jobs, well, you're having to now bring in an extra you know, 100% of, of market share on top of what you've already got. And that's going to come at a cost. 
you, you don't get that for free. It's no different to right now as if you were going out there to try and increase your market share, there's a cost involved in that. There's a marketing and acquisition cost uh, involved in trying to, to, to increase that market share. And that's why it's our belief that trying to maintain volume in a downturn is, is actually, it's, it's plain dangerous. You're going to end up loading on a cheaper work. You're going to end up increasing your risk in an already risky market because it, you're in a downturn. And not to mention, you know, you're likely going to end up taking on opportunities that are outside of your comfort zone or outside of what your business and yourself are actually experienced in, which only adds to another layer of risk. An example of this is actually, I remember back during the, the, the GFC is hearing about a successful Brisbane-based landscaping company that had gone under. They'd been in business for, I think it was 27 years. Um, they were profitable, you know, and they'd achieved a lot over those, those decades, those almost three decades. But when the GFC hit our shores, you know, obviously there was the delay from what we saw in America to what we hit, hit, had here. But when they, when it did eventually hit our shores and they started to experience a downturn in work, you know, their volume had taken a hit, but they didn't want to let their guys go. They had a lot of long-term employees that they didn't want to lose. And this is something that we saw a lot. So what they did was actually take on a large military contract in Townsville, which for any of those who don't know, is roughly you know a 15 hours drive time north of Brisbane if you were just to hit the road straight and not stop anywhere. So it's you know it's quite a hike from from HQ. It's quite a hike from from their home base. But their rationale was to take on this project at a low margin to keep the guys on. You know the management team they all thought it was a sound decision, but the reality was this opportunity was outside the criteria of of what they typically deliver. And long story short, there's a lot of stop, start, and rework. And, you know, the whole timing of the project delivery was off and it was completely out of step. So the project just didn't end up flowing how they intended it to flow and the job ran out of control. And the sad reality was because they priced it at those lower margins is they just didn't have the margin there to cover, you know, those errors that kept happening, those project delays, those budget blowouts uh, that happened because it was, you know, outside of that job criteria that I'm talking about. And in the end, that one project had actually cost them a couple of million dollars, which was enough to sink the company. And you know, sadly, the lesson there was taking on that project to save some jobs was actually the reason why everyone in the company lost their job. Had they just downsized, took on projects that met their criteria, the business would still be there today. And that's, you know, that's a typical story that we see so often. You know, it doesn't matter how big you are, how successful you are, no one is immune to, you know, downturns and making bad calls to, to try and maintain volume. And that's why, you know, coming into this downturn, you need to try and avoid those same mistakes and following the footsteps of these contractors who have now, unfortunately, you know, had the worst situation possible happen. Now, with that being said, though, I'm not saying you shouldn't look to other markets or other opportunities outside of what you're already doing. What I am trying to say, though, is, is to attempt only what you can afford to lose. You know, it's probably best not to go big and throw your eggs into a new opportunity or a new market or a new work type that you're unfamiliar with like that that landscaping contractor did. What you've got to do is, is manage the risk and the reward scale. Be smart and don't take on things that, you know, are going to put you in a really, really risky position and, and your business in a risky position as well as, you know, the livelihoods of everyone else that works for you. Be smart, play the game smart, manage the risk and the reward scale. Now, with that aside, the golden rule of everything I'm trying to talk about there is you know, part one of the strategy of protecting your gross margin is to not cut your prices. I cannot stress this enough. It is not a, a it is not a sound strategy to to try and maintain volume and thinking you're going to be better off. It's always better to protect your gross margin, protect your profitability, and downsize. In fact, the reality is for most of you, you should actually increase your prices. Um, and this might sound a bit ridiculous going into a downturn, but from my experience working with trade and construction businesses across the country, in most cases. People aren't charging enough to begin with. Even now in you know, an expansion period of the economy and, and where things have been good, people aren't pricing where they need to be. And the reality is if you've got a low profit margin now, before you know tough times, before a downturn, before a potential recession, then chances are you're going to be in serious trouble when you know those downtimes do come because you're not going to be you know making the cash and you're probably going to be more of a position and more prone to getting your prices pushed down even further which is going to put you in a really really dangerous position where you might not even be able to cover costs so that's why for a lot of you you actually need to commit to achieving higher margins before shit hits the fan so let's look at the numbers again here we got the the same scenario uh, modeled out from before but now we've got a third scenario here what i've actually done is gone so there's still the 1,250 opportunities. The conversion has actually reduced to 30% uh, in this case. And that reduction in conversion has happened because we've increased our prices by 10% uh, in this column. So now our average job sales size is 3,300. 
the the job cost still the same, two thousand. Average job gross profit now though has increased by three hundred dollars to thirteen hundred dollars, uh, which is fantastic, and which has also increased our average job gross profit margin to thirty nine percent. Now again, extrapolate this over the year, what we end up with is a revenue of you know a bit over one point two million. We've got annual cost of goods sold of seven hundred fifty thousand. Uh, an annual gross profit of four hundred and eighty seven thousand uh, and an annual overhead of three hundred and fifty thousand dollars. And at the end of the day, what that's left you with is one hundred and thirty seven thousand dollars in pre-tax profit or an eleven percent annual pre-tax profit margin. Now, one hundred and thirty seven thousand dollars in pre-tax is no three hundred thousand dollars. But when you actually look at it from a percentage and margin perspective, this business is actually healthier than what the business is currently before the downturn. It's got a healthier profit margin. Yes, it from a from a numbers perspective, it's got less pre-tax profit, but the amount of pre-tax profit it's actually producing for the amount of revenue it's turning, it's actually performing better. It's it's in a healthy position. And this is happening during a downturn. This is happening where we cut the volume of jobs from a thousand jobs to 375 jobs by just increasing your price by in this case by 10% and you know downsizing the business and the overheads to a sensible amount that's appropriate for for that business, which in this case where overhead's probably accounting for 30% of revenue, this is a really, really great alternative in the downturn. Yes, the volume has decreased. Yes, in this case, you're having to let people go. Yes, you're having to you know, find ways to cut more overhead. But at the end of the day, this is a much better business than the business who cuts 10%. Even though the business who cuts 10% has got double the amount of work coming in. They're doing worse off because they're not prioritizing profit. They're prioritizing volume again. At the end of the day, you need to prioritize profit and not volume if you want to succeed in this downturn. So looking at this, you know, for some of you, it might actually be best to go ahead and, and raise your prices because if you've got less opportunity to cover your overhead, then you need to maximize every opportunity that comes along to be able to keep your doors open. Now, you know, if you increase your prices, expect more no's. But again, this is all about trying to capitalize on, you know, there's, there's less opportunities out there. We need to make the most of them. Now, of course, I don't know your particular situation. You know, if you've got one or two key clients, I'd be a little bit more hesitant with this and probably prioritize introducing yourself and, and marketing, which I'll talk about in a second to making sure you're, you're de-risking your model. But, you know, this is something that you should definitely consider in your business uh, rather than, you know, going ahead and cutting your prices. In fact, to, to try and hammer this point home even further, I'll run through some numbers of a client of ours and how we help them implement this profit-driven business model coming out of COVID. So what we have here is on the left, uh, on the left column, we have the volume-driven business. Uh, and on the right column, we have the profit-driven business. Now, the volume-driven business, they were having 2,000 leads. Uh, their inquiry to quote conversion was 70%. So that means they were converting 70% of those 2,000 into quotes. So that means they had to provide uh, 1,400 quotes uh, throughout the year. Now, from those 1,400 quotes that they were providing through the year, they were converting roughly 15% of those into jobs, uh, which meant they had roughly 210 jobs that they were completing annually. Now, their average job price was roughly $6,000. Their average job cost was roughly $3,315. Uh, that meant, you know, extrapolating that again out over the year, their total job costs uh, was roughly, you know, close to $700,000 or so their COGS. Uh, their annual sales revenue was a bit over $1.2 million, leaving them with a gross profit of $500,000 and $63,000. Uh, their overhead was $510,000. So that mean they had an annual operating profit of $53,000, which is, you know, that might seem all right, but the reality is that's only a 4% pre-tax operating profit margin, which for this kind of business isn't enough. Realistically, you need to be 10% or above. This business at the time was really operating in that life support region where, you know, if something was to go wrong, things were to go south. Uh, they would struggle to be able to actually, you know, survive that period. Not to mention on top of all this, they're also spending, you know, roughly two hours, you know, to deliver each quote, which meant they were spending 2,800 hours quoting every single year where 2,380 of those hours, you know, never amounted to a job because they were only converting 15% of them, which is pretty crazy, right? A lot of time being wasted quoting uh, on the wrong opportunities. Uh, obviously, this wasn't good enough. So here's what we proposed. First, we focused on cutting down the conversion from inquiry to quote. So they weren't wasting so much time quoting jobs for people who were most of the time just, just price shopping, just, price, just you know the budget buyers. Uh, what we did here was actually introduce a consultation fee and a deposit, uh, which are our BS meters. That was our way of weeding out those tire kickers who weren't serious to begin with. Um, and what this did was cut down their quotes from 1,400 
to 240 per year, which it was a huge time saver, huge cost saver. Um, you know, did they lose jobs by introducing the consultation fee and deposit? You know, with some clients who who may have went ahead if they if they didn't have those two things there in place. Sure, they, they actually chances are they probably would have. But the reality is the lost revenue and profit from those those few jobs that they could have got over the line was incomparable to the savings made in both time and money from cutting out over a thousand quotes per year. That's a huge, huge saving in in time and cost. It allowed them to focus on providing a better service and experience to those 240 more qualified leads who already had some buying with the consultation fee. They put some skin in the game. Um, and that actually enabled them to, to increase their prices by 20% because they're more qualified leads uh, that were more bought in at that time. Uh, and it also allowed them to increase their quote to job conversion rate from 15% to 16% because the, the people that they were quoting for, again, were more qualified. Now, at the end of the day, that meant that they ended up delivering 144 jobs per year. But even though that's nearly 70 less jobs than, than before, and now they're turning you know, nearly $200,000 less in revenue, because they increased their prices and introduced the consultation fee, they were now making $600,000 in gross profit, which is 40K more than their original business model. But because they reduced their overhead from delivering less work and removing a full-time salesman role because they cut their quotes down, they were now making $200,000 in pre-tax operating profit, which is now an 18% pre-tax operating profit margin. Less volume, less revenue, but more profit and a healthier business. That's the power of being profit-driven. So again, a big reason why you need to focus on becoming a profit-driven business owner yourself and potentially looking to increase your prices and readjust your, your, your sales process and your business model to accommodate for that. Now, going back to the pricing side of things, uh, pricing, of course, should always be specific to, to your business. Uh, but just for, for the sake of, of, of this training and this masterclass, some good benchmark targets to aim for uh, across a few different markets, uh, you know, for maintenance of service, whether you're commercial or residential, uh, 55 to 60% plus. Uh, for residential projects, so if you're a carpenter, you're doing patios, you're doing decks uh, and, and, and the like, you know, aiming for a 50% plus uh, uh, margin. Now, if you're a subby on, you know, new builds with builders, uh, try and aim for at least a 35% plus margin on those jobs. Uh, again, the same thing if you're a subby doing, you know, builder renovations work, um, you know, they're smaller jobs typically. Uh, so here you want to be aiming for a bit higher margin. So we got 40% plus there. Uh, and then for commercial projects, uh, aiming for at least 30% plus. Now, if you're looking at these, these figures and thinking they're just completely unachievable, uh, well, then you've got a, a bigger question to ask yourself there about, you know, are you really in the right market servicing the right clients? Um, or, you know, is it an issue with your service and that you actually aren't in a position to increase your, your price because you've got no pricing flexibility. But I won't go into that now. I'll talk about that in a second. But at the end of the day, you know, aiming for these targets is going to be the fastest way to prepare yourself for the next tsunami in the economy that's going to be coming our way. And I can promise you, uh, you know, these, these margins are achievable. We have so many clients who are implementing these targets successfully right now. Now it's changing their lives. Their bank accounts are growing. They're paying off debt. And, you know, that's the shit that needs to happen right now. While we're still technically in the good times, this is the time to, to, to start actioning stuff. You need to start you know, stockpiling that money. You need to start paying off debt. You need to prepare for that downturn that's coming. And the way to do that is to start aiming higher and charging more. Really, really important. You know, One of our service-based plumbing clients in Sydney four months ago into working with us increased his profit by 196% while only increasing sales by 25% because we established these targets to get consistency in his pricing. So if you're not confident in your pricing strategy, you too could be losing out on tens of thousands of dollars in profit and ultimately cash. So you need to get this dialed in because at the end of the day, you plan for profit, you price for profit, and there should be nothing random about it all. Now, if you want help with getting this sorted and, and making sure that you actually build a profit-driven business, then make sure you reach out to our team. This is really an area that, that, that we highly specialize in, in in helping our clients achieve. But with that aside, let's dive into how you actually make this happen. So when it comes to raising prices with existing clients, make sure the price you want to charge makes sense to the value that you're providing in the delivery phase. If the service and, and the experience you're providing to your current client sucks, then of course, you're going to have limited pricing flexibility. You're not giving them a very good reason on why they need to start paying you more You know, in the downturn. There's, there's no real good reason for it. So you need to be over delivering. And that's not just from you know a quality or or you know the the type of work you deliver, mainly from the experience and the service that you're providing. 
For example, if you're working with builders, that means working in well with supervisors and other trades, you know, not being a headache like so many subcontractors can be on sites, you know, prioritizing strong communication so that supervisors and site managers are kept in the loop with where you're at and, and with what's going on. Uh, you know, becoming an ally to the builder and helping them solve problems early rather than just downing tools and making, you know, issues someone else's problem, which is ultimately at the end of the day, got to blow out the builder's timeframes and blow out the builder's budget. Uh, you also need to look at the entire project, not just through your component of work. So that's really important. Uh, this way, you know, you're not just pigeonholing yourself. You're actually looking to offer any suggestions to the builder on how they can fast track timeframes or where they can save money on the project, which is really, really going to position you and, and differentiate you from, from other subcontractors. Uh, you know, these are all areas that, that largely subcontractors just aren't thinking about. You know, in most cases, they're just, they're thinking about themselves. Now, don't get me wrong. I know there's a lot of pain in the ass builders out there who just take everything I'm talking about here for granted. But, you know, the question is there, is that a builder you really want to be working for at the end of the day? And should you be going out there uh, and, and introducing yourself to new people? If that is the case, like I'm saying, get out there, introduce yourself, shake some hands and, and find builders who will actually appreciate this stuff, appreciate the over delivery and appreciate, you know, you being an ally to them and, and be happy to pay more for it because they see you as an ally. And trust me, those builders are out there. I'm actually working with a client right now who's charging 50% plus gross margins with his current builders. And they're more than happy to pay it because he provides an exceptional experience and service for them. That's the key. If you do the things I'm talking about here, just like our client, you'll stand out from the crowd and the builder won't want to lose you and you'll have greater pricing flexibility. I was actually listening to a story of a, a painting contractor uh, the other day who who was uh, had a business during the GFC. And he said, you know, when it was getting tough, um, they they immediately jumped to reducing their prices to make more sales happen. Um, and, you know, after a week of making literally zero sales, even with that price reduction, he decided to change his strategy. So rather than bogging down his sales process and his business on price, he actually flipped it on its head and he started focusing on over delivering for customers in the sales process. And a week later, he locked in over $60,000 of work at a 50% GP. Yes, he had less opportunity, but again, he kept his prices the same so he could make the most of every opportunity that came along. That's how you need to approach this downturn. While everyone's cutting their prices, having to make shortcuts to keep afloat, focus on the other side of the occasion. Focus on over delivering on experience and service to stand out even more from everyone else. When everyone else is you know, providing a shit service and when everyone else sucks, this is going to be the opportunity to build greater loyalty with your current clients and get you access to new ones and not just any new one, but the right ones, which is going to be really, really important. Now, when you're raising prices with new clients, it's a bit different. Um, the focus here is now on marketing and sales because new clients have never used you before. They have no idea what value you bring to the table. Uh, and obviously there's going to be, there's going to be risk associated with that because at the end of the day, what's going on in their head is they're just thinking, you know, are you going to over deliver? Are you going to be just like everyone else? Or are you going to be a complete dud? That's what the customer's thinking. This is why whether the economy is good or whether the economy is bad, you never want to be a business that sells solely on price because great customers want more than low price. What they want is value for money. They want to have confidence that you'll deliver what they're after and strong marketing and sales infrastructure that communicates that you're a professional and a premium contractor will do just that. You'll automatically give yourself greater pricing flexibility with the right customers and you'll convert more jobs. With less volume, conversion becomes even more important. That's why your marketing and sales needs to make yourself appear different from your competitors. And here's some examples of things that you can do that, that we've done with clients to, to essentially do just that. We've got professional websites with strong messaging. Um, Strong social media presence, showcasing capability, showcasing culture, uh, a solid Google My Business profile that's stacked with reviews. That's a big one if you're in the residential space. You know, that's going to be a big point of credibility for you. If there's 100, in this case, 132 reviews there, uh, you know, I'm going to be more likely to go with him versus the guy who's got, you know, one or two reviews on their Google My Business. A professional proposal for jobs valued over a few thousand dollars, not just, you know, the typical generic one page quote that that gets exported from service mail or trade file or whatever. Put the effort in, especially for those bigger jobs. And even if it is a smaller quote, making sure it's not just, you know, shitty, unbranded, unstructured, sell the story, um, you know, make it look professional, make it look clean, break down what's involved. You know, not necessarily a price breakdown, but selling the story in the context of the job and, you know, the way you're going to do it differently to everyone else that's going to perceive how you do it as more valuable. A strong capability statement that communicates why you're different and why you're superior to everyone else. 
uh, information booklets that educate the customer on higher ticket sales. All of these marketing and sales tools are really, really critical in positioning yourself as a contractor that new customers are going to be happy to spend more money with. For example, I actually have a carpentry client that didn't have much marketing and nothing really stood out about them from, from a marketing standpoint other than, than their work. And so customers only really knew how great they were after they'd already hired them and they'd already taken the chance on them to deliver the job. And you know, at, at the end of the day, that was that was going to keep conversion low because if someone doesn't know about it as, for, as a new customer, well, they don't know about it. Um, and isn't that something we see so often in this industry? So what we did was actually, you know, help them implement these tool uh, to lower the decision risk for the customer. And what ended up happening is they went from pricing jobs at a 15% gross margin to winning projects at a 50% gross margin within literally seven days. We more than tripled their gross profit within seven days. That's massive. So start thinking about these different marketing and sales tools and how you might be able to implement some of them into your own business. Now, if you want to remove any guesswork or you know how to figure out how to do this all on your own, um, make sure you reach out to us at Trademan's Accountants to get results like this in your business. Uh, you know, Obviously, outside of accounting and coaching, we also have all the material, systems, scripts, and step-by-step -step guides to help you, you know, grow your business on demand. Uh, and obviously, you know, we're a heavily one-on-one -on -one focused operation here. So, you know, we're there critiquing what you're doing. We're looking at it. We're reading over it, uh, the material that gets created to, to make sure that, you know, you're really getting the results that you should be at the end of the day. So again, reach out. We're more than happy to help. Now, outside of the tangible tools, it's actually the intangible stuff that matters as well. Um, this includes stuff, you know, how quickly do you answer the phone? How are your sales skills? How do you follow up? Are you looking to understand the motives of the decision maker so you can better provide solutions that will better your chances of actually getting the job across the line? Um, are you selling stories on how you've delivered similar jobs and tackled, and tackled similar problems in the past? Are you positioning yourself as the expert, their trusted advisor, their, you know, the low risk, high value option, uh, someone that they know they can depend on to deliver as promised and solve big problems quickly if shit hits the fan. That's a really great position to be in with clients. Um, you know, the, the key here is, you know, trying to transfer confidence and certainty and resetting the buying criteria of the customer. Because if you want to increase prices, I can promise you that you can, but you'll need to position yourself as the premium contractor. If you want to increase prices, I promise you that you can, but you'll need to position yourself as the premium contractor. And that means from both the tangible sales tools we've been talking about, as well as the intangible stuff here as well. Really, really, really important. Now, the second part of protecting your margins is to make sure that you're actually pricing accurately to begin with. Now, obviously, I can't cover everything here, but I do want to make one really important point, and that is to make sure you're considering all the costs related to the entire job or the entire project. You know, mistakes and errors in building up job costs is the fastest way to erode your profit margin because you're losing profit before the job's even begun. It doesn't matter if you quoted a job at a 50% margin if you've estimated the costs incorrectly from the start because when those job costs blow out, the first thing to go is profit. So make sure you spend the time to accurately determine all the costs involved in delivering the job. Now, the most effective way to do this from my experience is to actually break up your job into three core components. Those are pre-delivery, delivery, and post-delivery. Doesn't matter if we're talking about a small 10-minute job or a six-month-long multi-stage project, they'll all have these three components, either at a, you know, at a macro level of the entire job or at a micro level for those larger projects from a day-to-day -day perspective as well. Now, the power of looking at jobs this way is it's going to stop you from only considering the cost directly related to delivering the work on site, which is actually a huge mistake and something that, that we see so often when it comes to pricing. You know, there are so many other costs that sit outside of just the delivery phase that are necessary for you to actually deliver the work. And if they're necessary costs, then they should be billed to the customer. You know, for example, uh, for smaller maintenance jobs, data has shown that on average, there's actually an extra 60 to 70% of added labor cost on top of the based on site costs. This means that if you think it's going to take two hours for you to deliver the work on site, there's actually probably going to be another one to two hours of labor time on top of that that is actually necessary to successfully deliver the job. Those are costs like travel time, uh, scheduling, um, picking up materials, closeout costs, and, and other costs like that, that that sit outside of the actual delivery component of the job. And these are the costs that are coming from the pre-delivery and post-delivery phases of the job. So if you're not accurately considering these additional or hidden costs, then you're going to be eroding your gross margin on every job before you even begin the job, which is a really, really dangerous position to be in. For example, I was actually working with one of our roofing clients. And when we first started working with them, they were using an old square meterage rate that their boss had actually used 
So they had literally no idea where this figure had originally come from or what what actually made it up, what was the build up to get to that, that rate. And it turned out that once we broke down their pricing numbers, they were actually massively undercharging their projects because they weren't considering the pre-delivery and post-delivery phases of the job, not to mention the reality of on-site delays from builders or weather that, that just happens on these kinds of projects, especially as a roofer. So what we did is we immediately got them to increase their labor hours on smaller jobs by 200% and larger projects by 150%. Naturally, that that meant that you know all those extra hours that within the project, as well as sitting outside of the project, they were now being considered. And the best part was, again, because our client was really, really solid in delivery, was really great at providing exceptional experience to his builders. He wasn't just like a lot of the other cowboy roofing contractors out there. It meant his builders were actually happy to pay him more for his increase in price. They knew how good he was, and now he was able to cover all of his true costs to actually deliver the project, which skyrocketed his gross margin and ultimately his income at the end of the day, which is really, really fantastic. All right, so what does this actually look like? Well, for the delivery phase, this includes cost to prepare and get to site. So this is going to be things like drive time, uh, tolls, pre-job visits, uh, client meetings, job management and administrative costs, uh, running around to different suppliers, picking up hired equipment, organizing and collecting permits or, or access keys, all the stuff that that you need to do in order to prepare the job and get to site before you can actually deliver the work. Um, whereas for post-delivery phase, this includes costs that are needed to actually close out the job. This in, might include things like um, cleaning, uh, you know, and picking up used materials around site, final customer walkthroughs, showing them around, you know, giving them that feeling of, wow, they have delivered on what is promised. Really important, not only from a cost perspective, but from a uh, customer experience perspective. Uh, this also includes touch-ups, invoicing, inspections, uh, driving back to the yard, all these things are cost relative to the job and are necessary for the job as well. So it's important that you're considering them and that you're billing them to the customers. You should not be wearing these costs. On top of uh, this stuff is on a side note, make sure you're also considering plant and equipment costs too. This means factoring in you know, the replacement costs, idle costs, uh, usage costs, all that needs to be factored in your pricing. Otherwise, you know, you might be thinking you, you're pricing one way, but really you've got this, this, this large equipment cost that's just eroding away at your margin. This is especially important for, you know, civil contractors, demo contractors and stuff like that. Really, really critical to make sure that you're not eroding massive chunks of your profit and that you're not destroying your cash flow, you know, without you even knowing about it. Now, as a final point on this, once you figure out what the cost is or the true cost is, don't apologize for it. If you estimate a job to cost $10,000 to deliver, then that's what it costs. The numbers won't lie to you. If your estimate tells you that it takes 20 hours to do a job safely and to your standard, then it takes 20 hours. No ifs, no buts. Don't fool yourself into thinking, oh, I could do it faster. Oh, I could do it cheaper. Trust your estimation process. Yes, you should always be looking for greater efficiency and greater productivity or better prices from suppliers to reduce your costs overall. But at the end of the day, don't lie to yourself. If you start to undercut yourself, then you're only going to make it that much harder and more stressful for you to complete the job safely, on time, and to your standard. Your costs are your costs. Don't apologize for them. All right, so that's everything to do with the pricing side of things. Relating to that, though, is you also need to make sure you're back costing jobs. Uh, and this is going to be super important moving forward because when you're quoting, you're really just taking a calculated guess on what you think it will cost to deliver a job. So it's important that you've actually got a feedback loop in place that's letting you know whether or not you're accurately guessing what those costs will be. Because if what you've quoted doesn't quite marry up with what it actually took to deliver the job, then you're going to be eating away at your margin. Because if you're not getting that feedback loop, then every job you quote could be out, which is especially true in the current environment with inflation, increases in costs, and also the problems that are now you know, apparent with logistics. They can be a real killer. Like if you're you know, having to take more trips to site than you originally planned because you didn't have that surety of materials there uh, and you're having to go back to supplies all the time. That's going to be an increase in cost. You need to be considering that. And you're only going to identify that a lot of the times through back costing. For example, let's say you have a $100,000 project. And let's say you estimate the cost to deliver that job, the cost of goods sold, labor, materials, and whatnot to be $60,000. That means you're expecting to be left with $40,000 in gross profit or a 40% margin. But let's say that you've based these costs off some older figures and now those costs have gone up by 20%. Now, the job's still going to be $100,000. It's still the same sales size. But what happens now is your cogs have gone up to $72,000, up $12,000 or 20%. That means your gross profit is now only $28,000 
or a 28% margin. It's dropped $12,000. Costs are up 20%, but your margin is down 30%. Just let that sink in for a little bit. It's a huge hit right. And then you amplify that across 50 jobs, 100 jobs, 1,000 jobs, 10,000 jobs. That only gets worse. This is why it's super, super important that you stay across your margins and why now more than ever, it's super important that you back cost your jobs. An example of this is when we started working with one of our clients for the first time is they were super confused as why the margins they were charging on their projects weren't reflecting in their profit and loss. And you know that's something that we see a lot. But in their case, it was actually even more extreme because they'd actually put a lot of hours into nailing the, the specifics of their pricing process. You know, they'd gone deep into calculating specific labor rates down to the double decimal. They were tracking the, the time differences between different crews and even getting custom pricing spreadsheets built for themselves to try and, you know, nail down on that pricing and make sure it was accurate. But at the end of the day, their pricing was still off. The margin they were charging wasn't being seen in their profit and loss. That's why rather than, you know, trying to go deeper and deeper and deeper into pricing, the first one we told our client to do was to actually take a step back and back cost their past projects, back cost their jobs. This way that they could actually see what was going wrong. And sure enough, after back costing around 10 or so projects, it was clear that they just weren't considering those three phases that I was talking about earlier. They'd become so obsessed with getting the cost right in the delivery phase that they'd completely missed those two other phases. And almost overnight, once the client realized this and they fixed their pricing, uh, their margin skyrocketed to, to over 50%, which was just sensational. That's the power of back costing. That's the power of having that feedback loop to make sure that what you're actually doing on the front end in your quoting is actually reflecting in the back end in terms of how you're actually delivering the job. Now, what is back costing? Well, back costing is actually super simple. All you need to do is look at the costs you estimated and compare them against the cost of what it actually took to deliver the job. You can do this with a pen and paper, a spreadsheet, or even most job management tools. Now, a word of warning, just be careful with job management tools because for them to actually be useful, you need accurate data entry, which a lot of the time doesn't happen in these tool sets. That's why I recommend to begin with, you should actually manually back cost at least 10 to 20 of your latest jobs or projects to get a gauge of how you've been going. This is something that I do all the time with many of my clients on coaching sessions because in most cat, because in most cases, they're not doing as well as they thought they were. And usually there's a pattern as to why that is, whether they're underestimating labor or being too optimistic with productivity or even something that we see a lot now is not factoring in those materials price spikes that that are so common. For example, another one of our clients I was running this through with was um, after we broke down, you know, 10 or so of their projects is it was clear that they actually had the same pattern happening over and over and over again. And that was that they were continually overcharging on materials, which is fine. That's great. You know, they were saving money on materials than, than what they were actually quoting, which is fantastic. But they also had the pattern of continually undercharging for labor, which wasn't good at all. Because at the end of the day, like most trade businesses, labor is typically the largest cost. So any gains that they will make or any profit gains that they were making from materials were immediately being destroyed by their labor overruns, which wasn't good. But because we back costed, we were able to fix this and ultimately fix our client's margin uh, and get it where it needed to be, which is really, really good. But again, this is why you need to be back costing too, to see whether or not you're actually pricing accurately yourself. It's super, super, super important. Um, and to actually help with this, we've got a simple back costing spreadsheet that you can use. So download that for free below that video. Just fill in the numbers of the estimated costs uh, and then obviously the, the actual cost, and it'll tell you uh, how you performed against your original quote. Use that as feedback to, to, to optimize your, your future quotes moving forward. Now, outside of back costing or on top of back costing, you also need to review your profit and loss because the margins you achieve on the job are one thing, but the margins you achieve in the PL could look very different depending on the dead time or any other costs that haven't been accounted for to deliver the work. You know, at the very least here, Make sure you're looking at your profit and loss monthly if you're a service-based business and at least quarterly for larger project-based businesses. That way you're getting some level of feedback to let you know how you're actually going. Now, this obviously highlights the importance of having everything in your backend structured correctly from the accuracy of your data to the structure of your chart of accounts. Um, you need to have this stuff in order for your profit and loss to be able to actually tell you something useful that you as the business owner can make sound decisions with, which unfortunately uh, is something that we rarely see. I was actually on a coaching session just the other day with one of our full service accounting clients. And from the outset, they seem very positive about their numbers. You know, their revenue had almost doubled from 2021 financial year. 
uh, their profit was in the six figures and they had more opportunity than they could actually handle with their current business. And, you know, many would have looked at their figures and thought, you know, they were doing great. But once I actually broke down the numbers and restructured their chart of accounts to be truly reflective of actual market conditions, it turned out they actually lost $30,000 in net profit in the 2022 financial year. They'd actually lost money. They went from thinking they were doing great to realizing, oh shit, we're not doing as good as we thought we were. We need to make some serious changes. That's what your profit and loss, that's what your financial statement should be telling you. But unfortunately, most of the time we see that trade businesses do not have their financial statements or even their accounting and bookkeeping in the shape that it needs to be to give them useful information. Now, if you feel like things aren't right in your business and you want assistance with your books to get them in order and get the right information so you can better run your business, then make sure you reach out because we'd love to help. And in the same regard is if you feel like your pricing is an area that you want to work on, uh, then make sure you reach out on that as well. Because, you know, pricing is, is really an area as accounts that we specialize in. And we help our clients a lot to make sure that they're not robbing themselves of profit. You know, getting these two areas right in your business is super, super important and can actually skyrocket your profit. So again, I recommend reaching out. Now, the other side of protecting your margins is reducing your job costs. This is things like, you know, labor, materials, subcontractors, equipment, hire, all the stuff we've been talking about, all those costs that are, you know, directly related to delivering the work that you do. Like I said earlier, you know, we're currently experiencing challenges with materials supply. There's, there's spikes in material prices. There's more project delays, increases in labor costs. And you know, all these things are going to eat away at your margin. So it's important that you're actively looking to reduce your job costs wherever possible. Now, obviously, that's pretty self-explanatory. So what I'll do is I'll just dive into some strategies that you can look to implement pretty much straight away. First and foremost, uh, reduce any material wastage on site, uh, leveraging overtime and better planning to maximize labor productivity. Uh, this one is especially important for contractors who are working off fixed contract values with builders like fire or security contractors. That's something we see a lot. Um, because in this case, you know, you don't have much flexibility with actual pricing where you improve your margin is through boosting productivity and reducing your cost of goods sold. So for example, we've actually been working with one of our clients in the fire industry uh, to boost their productivity through better planning uh, and scouting the project landscape to ensure that, you know, all work fronts are available. So there's no surprises or urgent rescheduling of work, leaving them to scramble for resources and, and materials that they don't have ready, because that's where they're going to lose money. And you know, if you're in the same boat, that's where you're going to lose money too. So again, look to better plan your jobs to maximize your productivity on those sites. Another point is to keep your field workers as billable as possible throughout the day. Uh, renegotiating wages or better structured salary packages. Negotiating with suppliers to get better rates or change suppliers altogether. We've actually had clients save upwards of $80,000 on jobs simply by changing suppliers. Some other stuff you can do is better manage your material supply invoices and make sure you aren't being overcharged. Um, better scheduling and plan jobs to reduce on-site efficiencies, limiting any callbacks and rework with better systems, accountability, and training, uh, streamlining and systemizing job processes with software. You know, we've had plenty of million dollar plus revenue clients coming to us who are still running jobs off their whiteboard and managing the back end through endless filing tablets, which at the end of the day is only amplifying their inefficiencies and errors and skyrocketing their job costs. So again, look to implement some software and get off the paper. Uh, another point is to better lead and manage your crews. You know, 1% improvements across all these areas is going to have a huge impact on your profitability and your cash flow. The better you or your management team lead and drive efficiency on the ground in delivery, backed up by effective planning and preparation, the lower your cost of goods sold will become. So again, make that a huge, huge focus. All right. So I hope you got some key takeaways from step two. Now, my challenge for you here is to one, don't drop your prices. In fact, for some of you, maybe even raise them. Two, Make sure you're pricing accurately and using all three phases, like I spoke about, the pre-delivery, delivery, and post-delivery phases. Manually back cost 10 to 20 of your latest projects and jobs. You know, look for those patterns. Where are the errors that you're consistently making over and over again that you can, can, that you can correct in future quotes? Uh, start assessing P&L at least monthly or quarterly, depending on whether or not you're a service-based or project-based business. You know, and look for those huge variations between your P&L and your back costing. And on top of all of that, Look for reductions in cost of goods sold. Look to better plan. Look for greater efficiency. Look to reduce those, those job costs that are naturally going to eat away at your margin. Really, really critical. All right, so that is step number two, protect your gross margin. Now, the next step in the Fortress formula is to run as lean as possible. You know, spending money obviously has to happen in any business, but if you're not careful, overhead costs can quickly stack up and cause three main things to occur. First, it'll destroy your net profitability. Because when costs go up, net profit margins go down. Secondly, it'll destroy your cash flow because you're most likely to be spending money faster than you're actually collecting it. 
And thirdly, it's going to put a lot of pressure on you to continue locking in more cash to keep the juggernaut going, which is where emotions begin to take over. You start pricing a win work rather than making a profit. You're pricing purely out of desperation to keep your team busy, uh, which as we know is really, really detrimental to step number two that we just ran through, which is protecting your gross margin. So overextended overheads are bad for you and your business, especially in a downturn or even worse, a recession. That's why you need to start cutting overhead now. Like I spoke about earlier, in a down market, it's far better to sacrifice volume to maintain margin. So if we're expecting a reduction in workflow, we should also plan for a reduction in overhead. Like I said earlier, overhead is there for the sole purpose of supporting the operation to be able to deliver the work. So if there's less work, then there should be less overhead. For example, if you expect a 15% reduction in revenue, then you should look to cut your overheads by 15% as well. This way, when the down cycle passes, you'll be in a much stronger position financially to be able to capitalize on the wave of opportunity that's going to come your way. Now, again, obviously, I don't know your specific circumstances, so make sure you go speak with your own accountant first about this. But common sense tells us that you should align your business with market realities. This means choosing to cut overhead and run lean. Because unfortunately, in our industry, there is a tendency to hold on to people and equipment in order to be prepared when the market returns. But unless you expect a very short downturn, there's a serious risk that any resources that you retain will be at a great expense to your business that will likely only be let go at a future date or worse, that the drain on your business may make it difficult or even impossible to recover when the market rebounds and we're back in that upswing. At the end of the day, the market always returns, but accurately predicting when it will return is difficult because we don't know how long a downturn is going to go for. So that's why the primary objective should be to profit during a downturn to maintain financial strength, which will be critical when the rebound occurs. Now, the best way to imagine this is if you're going to climb a mountain, would you rather do that with a 50 kilogram backpack or a 10 kilogram backpack. That's how I want you to look at your overhead. The recession is the mountain. So make sure you're carrying a light pack. Keep your overhead lean. Only bring shit in the pack that's essential to get you to the top of the mountain. Commit to bring only what is necessary for the climb. Now, from our experience, most healthy trade businesses have an overhead that accounts for you know around 20 to 25% of their revenue. This, of course, can vary depending on the business and what they're trying to achieve. But as a general rule, if you're sitting within this range, you're probably doing pretty well. So for example, if you're turning $3 million in revenue and you're spending a $1 million in overhead, that means your overhead percentage is at 33%. For every dollar you sell, $0.33 cents is being used to cover your overheads. Is this high? Maybe. Can you get it down to 25%? Maybe not, but you should definitely try I actually worked once with a small painting business and I'll use this example to, to, to paint the picture of how bad things could be as you grow and expand your team. Um, but at the time, this client was, was reckless with spending uh, and that ironically left him wondering things like, you know, where's all my money going? I should have more money by now. Why is more work not solving the problem? And these are things that we hear all the time. And, you know, obviously he was getting really frustrated at how little cash he had left over in his business. At the time he was doing around 60K a month uh, he was efficient in delivery. His gross profit was strong at around 50 to 60%. He could sell really, really well. And you know, at the end of the day, his clients loved him. Everything was extremely solid in his business, except for his overheads. They were sitting around 55% of his business, which pretty much eroded his entire gross profit, leaving nothing in net profit. In fact, he was only making around $17,000 in net profit every single year. That's why when he started working with us, we immediately removed the wastage and cut down his overheads. This skyrocketed his cash. And in the end, we turned that $17,000 into a projected $94,000 per year in less than a week, which is a 452% increase in net profit. Now, obviously, this is an extreme example, but I wanted to use it because this is a smaller business. So if you're turning, you know, one, three, five, or even $10 million per year, and you aren't across where your money has gone, well, how much could you be losing? How much net profit could you be sacrificing in your business? How much wastage could there be if you're not on top of your spending? Again, you need again you need to be running as lean as possible without hindering growth, profits, and productivity. Only investing in overheads that are actually needed, especially as we go into the downturn. Because you can actually live without more things than you think. And you can operate with less than you think. And your business will thrive with less than you think. And this idea will become more and more important as we enter further and further into this downturn. So here's my challenge. Go through every overhead line item in your profit and loss right now and ask yourself the question, is this necessary? If it's not necessary or it's not adding value to your business, then you need to consider cutting it. My challenge for you is to find 5% of overhead you can cut right now. 
Most people have at least three to 5% of overhead expenses being spent on stuff that they don't use or don't actually need, which is cash that shouldn't be funding wastage. So if your overhead is $500,000, try to cut out $25,000 of that. Does anything stand out? Are you spending too much money in any areas? Do you need to remove anything? If you're not at that 20 to 25% mark, then you may need to lighten your pack. Also go through your transactions because the devil is always in the detail. Dump your last 12 months worth of transactions into a spreadsheet and go through them line by line. Where are you wasting money? In my small painters example, I found around $77,000 of wastage that could have been cash in the business, but it was being spent on unnecessary insurances, supplier costs, subscriptions, ridiculous personal spending, phones, unused storage units, and all this other crap that just wasn't needed. That's why it's important to review your spending and review your overhead. Other examples might be reducing the days your cleaner comes to the office, selling off underutilized assets like machinery, negotiating better deals with suppliers or insurance or adjusting phone plans or making sure the team just aren't wasting money. And for some of you listening right now, this might mean sacrificing certain luxuries until you can actually afford to have them. Every little expense in your business adds up no matter how big or how small. So you have to have a tight grip over your spending. Something to consider moving forward is to use what's known as flexible overhead in your business as well. This is where you intentionally use temporary overhead in your business so that, you know, when tough times come around, you can actually drop them really quickly. You know, this includes temporary employee services for the office or field, short-term office rental space, uh, short-term office leases, or even equipment hire, anything that isn't permanent. Yeah, these things might cost more in the long run and efficiency could suffer if they're not managed well. But when you're going into a downturn, having the ability to drop overhead quickly may well be worth the expense. It'll ensure your business doesn't become a slave to volume. So when the market tanks, you can easily drop the overhead, take the hit in revenue and continue to concentrate on profit. I can tell you right now that a business skilled in flexible overhead is able to gear resources up and down temporarily and more quickly and economically than an average trade business can secure permanent resources. All right, so that's all for step three. The next step in the Fortress formula is to double down on marketing because in a downturn or even worse, a recession, leads are gonna dry up, opportunities are gonna dry up. And that's even more the case if you know the work type that you deliver isn't a necessity. Either way, you're gonna to need to double down on marketing. One of the biggest mistakes people make when going into a downturn or, or a recession is they stop marketing their business. They stop putting time, money, and energy into the one thing that is actually gonna keep their business alive. If you wanna survive the next downturn and kick some tail through it, you've gotta double down on your marketing and build your brand, starting now. You need to be smart here, identifying your main lead sources, your main work types, and, and your main clients that feed you the best work. That way, you know where to put your time and you know where to put your money. Know what works for you and do more of it. You know, I've just spoken about downsizing to maintain margins, but that doesn't mean you should just give up on building more relationships. This is the time more than ever to get out there and introduce yourself to more people. There's a direct relationship with the amount of people you know and the strength of those relationships to how much opportunity you'll get access to in this downturn. So as the workflow slows down and as most contractors use their new free time to sit down and to start feeling sorry for themselves, this is the time to get out there and to start shaking hands because not only are you fortifying your business in the downturn, but you're also setting yourself up for massive success in the up cycle when the floodgates open again. Now, doubling down on marketing is going to be even more important if you're only working for a couple of key clients because you're going to want to spread the risk. If you think about investing, when you put all your money into a single company, that's really risky because if the share price of that company tanks, you're going to lose a lot of money or you could lose all your money which is why you want to diversify your investing portfolio. Well, the reality is it's actually no different in your business. One is a terrible number in business. One client, one market, one project, one person in the business who knows everything is really risky. You've got a single point of failure. The best way to think about this is, is to think about a stool. If you've got a stool with one or two legs, it's, it's not going to be very stable. Whereas if you have five, 10, or even 20 legs, it's going to be much more stable. The same is true in business. The less client diversity you have, the riskier your model. And that risk amplifies in a downturn because it's often other people's businesses that has the effect on you. It's other people's business failures that can really affect you, like not getting paid and that whole knock-on effect that can actually sink your business. So again, if, if most of the work you do is coming from two or three key clients and one of them is to go under in the downturn, chances are you're going to be screwed yourself and you're gonna lose a huge chunk of your business. I was actually on the phone the other day uh, to a guy who had built his business up to, I think it was around a 40 plus man team in 2016. His whole business was dependent on a single builder 
who went bust overnight. So overnight, he actually lost everything himself and he had to start from scratch. So, so obviously that's a tragic story, but it's a great lesson for everyone else to make sure that you're diversifying your client base, that you're not just dependent on a few key clients. And at the end of the day, that's going to start with doubling down on your marketing. All right, so how should you double down on marketing? Well, there's so much to talk about on this topic, but for the sake of time, I'm going to rattle off some key strategies for you to implement. First things first, you need to take marketing seriously. If you're struggling with volume, not enough people know who you are. It's as simple as that. And chances are it's because you're not taking marketing as seriously as you should be. Now, I may seem a bit arrogant saying that, but this is just from my observation, working with trade and construction businesses all throughout Australia. It's always the common denominator. You know, a lot of contractors, they, they like to rely on word of mouth, but it's my belief that at the end of the day, word of mouth is like a free lunch. It's nice when you get one, but you can't rely on it to feed your family. You can't just sit around and wait for things to pick up in your business. You need to get out there. And in the same regard, you need to be marketing consistently in some capacity every single week, all year round, regardless of how busy you are. Even if you're booked out, this is not the time to take your foot off the gas because the marketing you do now is going to feed you over the coming months and the coming years. I can tell you right now that despite what many marketing agencies will try and sell you on, there is no magic pill for lead generation. The real secret is just consistency. It's a flywheel effect and over time you build momentum, whereas being inconsistent leads to the up and down roller coaster of work and cash flow. Marketing is one of the most important functions of your business, not a chore. So make sure you treat it accordingly. And that starts with your website. Your website is the centerpiece of your online marketing, the salesman that never sleeps. This is where ideal customers go to find more information about you and whether or not you're the right fit for them. So ideally, you want it doing 80% of the selling and getting people to take action and call you. Some key points are to make sure it looks professional and positions you as the premium contractor in the area. Make sure you're using powerful messaging throughout the pages that both educates and sells. Make sure it's functional and simple to navigate on all formats. Make sure it has bucket loads of proof and credibility littered throughout all the pages. That's going to be reviews. That's going to be accreditations, key projects, guarantees, key clients, anything that says to the customer or the prospect that, yeah, this guy is legit. He is a professional and premium contractor, and I can believe what he's actually saying on the website. If your website isn't ticking these four boxes right now, it's going to need work. Next is social media. Never in time has it been easy to market your business, so love it or hate it, social media is going to be a massive tool regardless of your market. And if you're not taking advantage of it, you're going to be falling behind. So make sure you get set up on all the relevant social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, whatever it is, and make sure your branding and messaging is completely congruent with what's on your website too. Another key point is to post a minimum of three times per week. Photos, videos, reviews, even tag customers, suppliers, and subcontractors for further reach. If you want, you can even use software like Content Cal to schedule the posts to automatically upload them to save time if needed so you're not having to remember to do it every single day. Put faces to the business and use social media to build brand personality. Showcase yourself, your team, your work, your suppliers, partners, customers, and show up and stay relevant in your prospects' minds. And on LinkedIn, make sure you're reaching out to people as well. That's a really, really big one. At the end of the day, you have a powerful free tool at your disposal to tell the world just how great your company is and connect with dream clients in every market. So make sure you use it. And to make this clear, this doesn't just apply to businesses servicing the residential market too. I could rattle off story after story of how this has benefited companies across just about every work type, big and small. So get on board and take advantage of this tool set. Next is your Google business profile. When people are searching an electrician near me, plumber near me, or whatever your trade is, will they see you or your competition? This stuff is easy money, so here's what you need to do. Firstly, set up, optimize, and maintain your account consistently throughout the year. There are plenty of tutorials online how to do this, so make sure you go and watch those. Point number two, get as many guru reviews as you possibly can. Ask every new customer, past customer, subcontractors, suppliers, employees, strategic alliances, mates, wives, girlfriends, family members with different last names for character views as well. These are all ways to stack those guru views. The more guru views you have, the more likelihood someone is to go with you. Next, stay consistent with the posts. Every social media post that you upload to all those relevant social media platforms, grab that same post and copy and paste it into your Google profile as well. Google loves these and it gives you a chance to have keywords sitting within your profile. And lastly, if you're not a physical shop front, convert your address to a service map so you show up in more organic search results. Really simple things to do, but a really powerful tool to get you more leads and more work coming in the door. Next is email marketing. Having the ability to email 200, 600, or even 1,000 past customers with the click of a button is a massive for business. I know people who generate at least $20,000 worth of work 
every time they send an email. I also know a plumber with over 45,000 customers on his database as well. So the bigger your list, the greater the results. Here's what you need to do here. Firstly, export all your client data from your accounting system or job management system into an Excel spreadsheet. Again, there are a lot of tutorials on this sort of stuff. So make sure you go to YouTube and check that stuff out. Next, sign up to a free email marketing program like ConvertKit and import your customer list into it. After that, set up an automated email sequence of special offers, company updates, holiday emails, advice, education, resources, product reviews, whatever it is, and send this to your email list or customer list once a month at a minimum to stay top of mind. And then lastly, after that, launch a Google review campaign to pass customers all at once. In some cases, I've generated up to 48 five-star reviews within one week. So this makes getting reviews a lot easier. Just make sure with that, you cite your list and remove anyone that you've had bad experiences with. Now, I know email marketing doesn't apply to everyone, but if you can't see email marketing being relevant for your business, the same principle applies. Keep in touch with your existing and past clients. How you do that specifically is up to you. Just don't overlook how much work can be generated from touching base with people you already know. Next is strategic alliances. This is massive. And for everyone listening, this alone could triple your business. What you want to do here is find non-competing businesses that also work with the same type of customers you do. If you're an electrician, for example, this could be plumbers, painters, carpenters, building inspectors, builders, property managers, uh, interior designers, pool builders, landscapers, engineers, the list goes on. What you can do is cross promote on and offline where you can with these other parties. In fact, we actually once helped a client get access to a 9,000 ideal customer email list of property investors to market to for free. So pick up the phone and introduce yourself. The more people you know, the more opportunity you'll generate. Now with builders, property managers, design consultants, and those sort of people, follow them online, open up the dialogue and start a conversation on LinkedIn, send a lumpy mail package, follow up with a call and book in a meeting to toss your hat in the ring. You want to earn their attention. That's my recommendation. We've had clients do this and win upward of $600,000 worth of work in five days from companies like CV Services or $2 million in a week from companies like QM Properties. So if you want to increase your volume, identify your dream clients and target them directly. Now, beyond this stuff, there's paid advertising, SEO and all that. Um, these can work. They are you know, tried and true methods, but just make sure you're not diving blindly into them and throwing away thousands of dollars for no return. We've seen a lot of people get burned in the process after being promised a world from digital marketers and advertising agencies. The key here is to always measure and assess your return on investment, or in this case, your return on ad spend, which should be based on bottom line profit, not top line sales revenue, which is typically what I see in the paid advertising space. So for example, if you're spending $2,000 on paid advertisement, and it's generating $20,000 in sales for you per month, that might sound like a great return on investment. But if your average net profit margin is 10%, then you're actually only breaking even. This is because your ad spend is also 10% of sales, meaning your ad spend is completely eroding your net profit. That's why it's important to know your ad spend break even point. And a simple formula to help you calculate this is monthly ad spend divided by average net profit margin. For example, if you're spending $4,000 per month on ads, and your average net profit margin is 15%, then you need to make $26,000 in sales from your ads just to break even. Again, make sure you're measuring your ROI and not just diving blindly into paid advertisement. Now, on top of just doubling down on marketing, make sure you're also using this time to build your brand. Marketing is one thing, but making sure you've built a brand to remember is another. You need to build a brand so good that people can't ignore you. In fact, a client of ours has absolutely mastered this. Big red fire trucks, a bold brand name, strong team, high performance culture, and it's all excellently marketed. They've been an interrupt to their local market, and now they've positioned themselves as a company that people want to work with. All from building a brand their market and competitors couldn't ignore. You need to do the same with your business. Stand out. It's an immediate competitive advantage. Now, I'm not saying you need to go out and buy fire trucks, but at the very least, does your branding look good? Is it professional? Are your vehicles wrapped? Are your team all wearing the same uniforms and do they look good? Are you on camera regularly being an expert? Do you have an impressive website? Is your social media congruent with your brand? You need to put your stamp into the world and into your local market. Own your area. Don't be the one not committed enough to pushing their company identity out there to the point where every time somebody turns a corner, they see your yard signs, they see your vehicles or whatever it is. Think about your area right now and some of the companies that come to mind. Chances are they're doing a pretty good job of branding their business. They've made a commitment to be everywhere. You need to do the same. So my challenge to you is this. 
Start doubling down in your marketing and building your brand. Super, super simple, but start chipping away at those tools. Start implementing some of those changes, some of those strategies that I talked about. It's going to be really, really critical to build more relationships so you have more workflow coming through the door, which is going to be even more important, uh, like I said earlier, if you've only got uh, a few key clients. All right, so that's step number four. Step number five now is to deliver exceptional customer experience. You can do all the marketing you want. You can take your clients out to dinner or take them out to golf trips. You can do all that sort of stuff. But if the customer experience and the service that you're providing throughout the job is the same as all of your competitors, then you've got to be at the mercy of price. Most contractors aren't very good at providing great customer experience. In fact, the bar has been set pretty low. And this is mainly because most contractors spend their time thinking about efficiency and thinking about quality. And, and you know that stuff's important and they should be thinking about that. But they make the mistake of believing if they deliver on time, on budget and to standard, that they should be considered the contractor of choice. That's just not going to be the case. It's not enough. What you need to do is deliver a good working experience. It's the experience that someone has with you that is going to be the differentiator. And it's what's going to help you to build a strong business in the long run. I can guarantee there are people out there not as good as you, but are better at experience who currently outperform you. So commit to providing a red carpet experience for every customer and client that you work with. This is what separates the men from the boys. This is things like how you communicate, how you show up, how you clean up, how you set expectations. Are you calling people back when you say you're going to? When you schedule a time with a client, are you showing up? Are you on time? Or are you late and disrespectful? Do you turn up and start projects on the day you promised the client? Or do you call that morning and say, ah, I can't make it, sorry. What about when there's an issue on site or there's callbacks? How do you respond? Do you push them back until it's convenient for you? Or do you move things around to give them that red carpet experience? Do you spend the time to listen and understand their situation, to keep them informed, educate them, and demonstrate that you value their business? Or do you leave them a to-do list when you leave the job because you left their place a mess? Do you finish on time? And if you can't, are you communicating why? All these things impact overall customer experience. And the better the customer experience, the more value the customer feels like they're getting and the more price flexibility you'll get in the long run. And here's a hack for this, guys. Look at your industry and what people typically complain about the most. Start there. That's where you need to focus your effort to begin with. For example, as a service-based tradie, if you went to your local Facebook community group and asked, what do you hate most about tradies? What do you think would come up? Well, in most cases, it's probably going to be you know, one of two things. They either don't communicate well or they're always leaving a mess. It's typically going to be somewhere in there. Look at the things that other guys are dropping the ball on and make those your strength. At the end of the day, the pendant light install is the pendant light install. The paint job is the paint job. The plumbing work is the plumbing work. Whatever your trade is, the work I'm sure is great. But where trade businesses shoot themselves in the foot is they don't make it a good experience for the customer. Sure, they might love the work that you've done, but it was a pain in the ass to get that job done. That's the low-hanging fruit you need to target to build a stronger business, build strong referrals, and build high prices for your work. It's in the experience. That's what you go for first. Make them feel the love. Make them feel that this is the best experience they've ever had with a contractor. This is always the first thing we touch on with all of our clients. To position yourself as a premium contractor who charges a premium price, you need to deliver exceptional customer experience and service. It's absolutely critical. So my challenge to you in this step is to identify what annoys people the most about your industry and make those your strengths. When you do that, you'll establish yourself as a company that delivers amazing experiences for people. And that kind of word gets around really, really fast. 42% of business to customer and 62% of business to business customers purchase more after a good customer experience. And that 52% of B2C and 66% of B2B customers stop buying after a bad customer experience. This is why you need to make exceptional customer experience your primary product. Seeing yourself as a company that services customers rather than a company that builds and installs stuff can really pay off in the long run. Most contractors are competent, but the contractor who creates a cooperative, positive, professional, respectful experience for their customer, whether it's a builder, an owner, a supervisor, a manager, or any other trade, they will just about always be the preferred contractor. So again, make sure you're delivering an exceptional customer experience. All right, so that's step number five in the Fortress formula. The next step, step number six in the Fortress formula, is to build your cash reserves. You need that cash cushion in business, especially in the downturns. It's your security and safety net if things go wrong because it's not only the downturn you have to worry about, what happens if you know a top performing employee leaves, a, a client drops, or you're struck by an illness? These are all factors that may have nothing to do with the downturn, but are all just as likely to happen in the bad times as they are in the good times. And either way, you need cash to cover them. 
If you have to immediately jump to a line of credit when things get tough, then you're likely in a really, really dangerous position where your business could spiral into a really bad debt situation really, really quickly. Not to mention that credit is only going to be harder to come by when traditional banks stop lending as much coming into a downturn. That's why you need to start building your cash reserves now. Of course, some might argue that stockpiling cash will slow growth and that those reserves will be better reinvested into the business. But to me, that just means that you're one misstep away from going under. It only takes one horrific job, one mistake, one unforeseen crisis to push the company closer and closer and closer to the edge. Or in our case now, a market downturn causing the company to overextend. If you've been in business a while, you already know of someone this has happened to. I just told you the story of the landscaper earlier. So thinking it can't happen to you offers little protection. So the question is then, how much should you have in your cash reserves? Well, in my experience, enough cash to fund roughly two or three months of overhead costs is a great goal. Obviously, I don't know your specific situation, so I can't provide a definitive answer for you. But at the very least, you need to start banking cash to cover at least two months of overhead. And in this case, that's my challenge for you in step six. You need to start trying to bank as much cash as possible. It might not be you know, at least two months worth before the downturn, but if you start now, you start prioritizing getting that cash and getting it in the bank account and preserving it, that's going to be really, really critical and a really great layer of protection for you coming into the downturn and then obviously on the other side so you can thrive in the opportunity. All right, so what I want to do now is model out how much of these changes that I've spoken about so far can actually impact your business. In the first example here, we've got a case where a business in the downturn has decided to downsize only. So that means they've, they've just focused on reducing their overhead. So here we have before the downturn, we have a thousand jobs being completed annually. The average job sales size for each of those jobs is $3,000 and the average job cost is $2,000. So similar to the example that we had earlier, which comes out to that $300,000 in pre-tax profit uh, and a 10% annual pre-tax profit margin. Now, during the downturn, what we've done here is there's been a 40% reduction in volume or jobs, just to simplicity's sake. Now, again, the numbers have stayed the same, but we've reduced that annual overhead from $700,000 down to $490,000 because there's been you know, nearly 50% of the workflow gone, we should be expecting a reduction in overhead. So in this case, that comes out to an annual pre-tax profit of $110,000 or an annual pre-tax profit margin of 6%. So as you can see there, downsizing your business is a very smart way to ensure that you're protecting your profit and then you're protecting your viability as a business going through the downturn and then preparing yourself onto the other side. Another example here is uh, downsizing with a 5% increase in price. So again, same numbers. All we've done here is increase that average job sales size by 5%, which takes it from three grand to $3,150. Now looking at this, you can see that we've gone now from an annual pre-tax profit of $110,000 from the other example to now $200,000. We've added an extra $90,000 per year in pure profit, purely from increasing our prices by 5%. So looking at this, even though $200,000 is no $300,000, this business on the right here during the downturn is actually in a more healthier position because it's got a better margin. The pre-tax profit is accounting for 10.5% of the revenue versus before the downturn when it was only accounting for 10%. It's a small variation, but it still holds true. Now, another example is we've got a downsize, an increase of price of 10% and a reduction in COGS of 5%. So uh, here we've got the sales size has gone from $3,000 to $3,300. Uh, our average job cost has gone from $2,000 down to $1,900. So looking at this extrapolated out, we've now got an annual pre-tax profit of $350,000 and an annual pre-tax profit margin of 17.6%. So in this case, even though the business is doing 400 less jobs for the year, nearly 50% less, it's making more profit and achieving a better profit margin, making it actually a healthy business. This is the power of just a few of those changes that I've spoken about above. If you can implement them and successfully implement them, your business can be transformed overnight and it could actually perform better than how you've actually been performing in past or how you're performing currently. So again, don't brush off the advice and the strategies and everything I've been talking about. If you can successfully implement what I'm talking about, you can get some sensational results and truly transform your business for the better, even in a downturn. All right, now at this point, I've only covered six of the seven steps of the Fortress Formula so far. There's still actually one more step to cover, and that step is to leverage specialist accounting and business coaching. Regardless of your size, your trade, or your market, 
up-to-date, accurate and proactive accounting, tax management, bookkeeping and strategic business advisory are essential when it comes to success, especially going into a downturn. Because in a downturn, your financial systems need to be set up and managed in a way that makes sense for you as the business owner. Because in order for you to truly run a tight ship business operation, you need to have complete financial insight, transparency and control. And the truth is behind every highly successful trade business owner, there is always a team of financial experts that's helping them to keep their finger on the financial pulse of their business while they get on with the job of running their business. Now, right now, you'd probably likely have your go-to accountant, but in our experience, most accountants are really only interested in filing tax returns and speaking once or twice a year. What you need moving forward is a team that works proactively to help you run a better business and actually earn more money now rather than meeting come tax time to simply outline you know, how you went when it's already too late. Where we're heading, you don't have the luxury of time. You need strategy, guidance, and results now. You get that from proactive, sleeves rolled up, expert accounting and coaching. This is all about giving you absolute clarity on your business model from your numbers, pricing strategy, opportunity channels, sales, marketing, taxation to teams and everything in between. Having a team of professionals working in the background to support, manage and allow you to keep your finger on the financial pulse of your business and earn more money is key. This is the exact service that you can expect when you choose to work with the team at Trade Business Accountants. Here's what some of our clients have to say about our service. It's an absolute life game changer for all business owners. Whatever you invest in them, you'll get back tenfold. Truly the best in the business. The TBA team will send you to the moon in terms of profit, systems, and optimization. Could not recommend them enough. The impact they've had in my business and personal life has been phenomenal. If you're after advisors, your search is over. For the first time since starting my business, I'm actually busy making money instead of being busy chasing work and earning nothing. I have no hesitation in recommending them to help you make more money and enjoy the balanced lifestyle, a true asset to any business, 10 out of 10 from me. So now we've hit a bit of a crossroad in this masterclass. And if you've been watching up until this point, I hope you've taken away a lot of useful items, a lot of value bombs, some epiphanies went off and you can start implementing right away. Now you can figure out a lot of this stuff on your own and you can try this way and try that way, but it might take you a long time and this will frustrate you and really hold you up. And obviously time right now is probably not a luxury that, that you can afford. So I want to present to you another way. And that's to use a proven system that we've already put together over the last number of years and refined it that all of our other top clients are using and you can use it too. A lot of clients come to us struggling with getting their strategy right or not having a strategy at all. And so we take them through our very refined strategies that don't take a lot of time, but cannot be skipped because getting this right or wrong is the difference between winning or losing in business. And even if you do have a strategy, trying to tackle your financials, marketing, pricing, sales, or growing your team without our frameworks, our playbooks, templates, our examples, and especially without our input and feedback is the difference between barely getting by, mediocre, and performing excellently. All right, that is it. That's the seven steps of the Fortress formula. Now, it probably felt like you're, you're trying to drink a fire hose with everything I've thrown you, you know, over the last 90 minutes or so. But I guess to review... Step one of the fortress formula, control the pace of your cash flow, get cash in as fast as you can, slow down the cash going out. That's going to be really, really critical to make sure that you're holding as much cash as possible at any one time in your business. You need that cash to be able to survive and thrive in a downturn. Step number two is protect your gross margin. Again, don't slash your prices. Make sure you're back costing. Make sure you're reviewing your PL. Uh, make sure you're trying to reduce your cost of goods sold as well. Doing anything you possibly can to protect that margin. It's going to be super, super important. And even further on that point, for some of you, this might even be increasing your prices altogether. Remember from the modeling, uh, increasing prices to, to protect margin is going to be a much more sound option than it is to just go and start slashing your prices to try and maintain volume. Step number three, run as lean as possible. You know, remembering that mountain example, you want to carry a light pack to get to the top of the mountain. You don't want to be carrying anything you don't actually need in business. Otherwise, it's just going to be another factor that's going to be eroding away at the cash that you need to be able to comfortably go through this downturn and really, really thrive on the other side. Step number four, double down on marketing. Like I was saying, this is not the time to take your foot off the gas. Even if you're busy, you should always have your foot on the marketing gas. It's going to be really, really critical. Uh, and in the same line, making sure that you're focusing on building a brand. Try and be everywhere. Try and be you know, a, a contractor that people just can't ignore. Build a brand so good that people can't ignore. Step number five, deliver exceptional customer experience. This one is just so important uh, moving forward and it just cannot be overlooked. If Again, we're in an experience economy, a customer experience economy. So it's critical that 
If you want to differentiate yourself and position yourself as the premium professional contractor that gives you greater pricing, flexibility, and customers are happy to pay more for that, uh, well, then you need to be delivering an exceptional customer experience. It is the key driver of value and the key differentiator. Step number six is to build your cash reserves. Again, this should be pretty self-explanatory like we went through. This is all about just making sure you've got cash in the bank because in, in a time like this, going into a downturn, and then of course, thriving on the other side is you want to have as much cash in your bank account as possible. And then finally, step number seven, leverage specialist accounting and coaching. Again, coming into a downturn, this is the time to get a team of business and financial experts behind you to help you make these transitions that we're talking about here in this masterclass so that you can not only you know survive this downturn, but again, thrive on the other side and absolutely capitalize on that expanding market when we come out of this downturn. Hugely important. So again, I recommend that you book in a call, have a chat to us and see whether or not we're a good fit and whether or not uh, we're going to be able to help you. Because for so many of you, that is a service that's going to become absolutely critical moving forward. But with all that being said, the key now is to implement. So to help you implement, I've actually included a simple 28-day Fortress Formula worksheet that you can use to plan out what strategies you're going to work on and in what order over the next 28 days to, to start fortifying your business. This way you can get started today on planning how you're going to survive and thrive throughout this downturn and obviously on the other side as well. If you can commit to one change every single day, your business and your cash flow is going to look completely different in 28 days. So for example here, we've got a bit of a filled out one. You can use this as a bit of a, a, bit of a guide in terms of how you need to fill this out. You can see here, again, just one change every single day. If you look to execute on just one thing I've spoken about in this presentation every single day or you know 90% of the days, maybe you'll leave Sundays and Saturdays free and that's totally fine. By the end of it, you will have a very different looking business that's going to serve you very, very well. So again, make sure you use that worksheet. You can download it for free just below this video so you can start making those changes today. All right. So that's everything that I wanted to cover in today's recession proof masterclass. I know we covered a lot, but you know, we need to talk about this stuff because we know it's coming uh, if it's not here already, to be honest. So I hope you got a lot out of this short training and a game plan on how you're going to best prepare for the incoming downturn. Again, this isn't a time to get scared or get all doom and gloomy. A lot of winning can be done when the going gets tough for everyone else. Because like I said, if you're prepared and you've got everything in place, this could actually be one of the greatest opportunities that you'll ever see in your business. Because when the fog clears and the skies open up, the trade business owners who were prepared will have an ocean of opportunity to come their way, to grow, to scale, to achieve more success, to make more money, to build the business of their dreams. That can happen on the other side of this downturn. But the question is, will one of those trade business owners be you? Mm -hmm.